Days after the highly anticipated Iowa caucus, the fallout continues. With New Hampshire just around the corner, the question is what happened this week and what happens next? Joining us via Skype to weigh in on all of this and how it could play out is John Nichols, National Affairs Correspondent for the Nation. And John, just before we, we came to you here, I just got an alert from the New York Times about the many, many inconsistencies in the quote unquote quality control data that the Iowa Democratic Party has put out. I mean, what do we know at this point about how we can trust these results? Um, it is time for all the campaigns to call for a verified audit, just to say, you need to bring in people who are professional who know how to do this, and there are such folks, trust me. Uh, but one thing that, that people are not aware of is there's pros who do union votes um, that are often tabulated from lots of different places on union recognition and things like that. So it's easy to get in professionals and do a full audit. I know the problem with that is, of course, that an audit won't be completed until probably, uh, who knows, you know, way down the line. So in some ways, the damage is already done. And, yeah, and that's yeah. important yeah. to note. But uh, we can actually get this right because I will strongly argue, as someone who attended a caucus, talked to people who ran a lot of caucuses, that these things were done well. They may have had some flaws, but generally done quite well at the grassroots. The problem is really as it's kind of fed up through the process. Yeah, John, we've heard that from several people who've attended the caucuses. The caucuses themselves were fine. It was all about the reporting. It was all about the Iowa Democratic Party. And now, that New York Times story, we're talking about over 100 precincts with riddled error-filled data. So that, at this point, John, should everybody just move on and we should just look to New Hampshire? I know it robs Iowa, Iowans of the say that they had of all the time and the money and everything that happened there. But I mean, this just seems completely implausible to trust as, as real. I tend to, to share many of your sensibilities there. Yeah. Um, and, but I will say one thing. The Iowa Democratic Party made a choice, not on Monday night, when they could have said, hey, we've got big problems. We're going to have to hold this for a long time. They made a choice on Tuesday where they, they basically said, well, we are going to start releasing returns. They are now in a process of releasing returns. They have to do the best they can to, to complete that. They can't leave it at 97 percent here. They should complete their process, tell us what they found. Then we should go for a verification. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's right. Foster the lie. And I'm not saying I'm not saying anything is a lie. I don't know that. But you can't create an impression. Right that that may not be true you you have to at least the arc that they got onto they should complete and then at that point you should definitely bring in professional auditors mm -hmm. well and what the the real manipulation of this process that is not conspiracy or anything like that is as you put it they made an intentional decision to put out incomplete results that we now know were also error filled. That was an intentional decision that they made. And look, it's one thing on election night, results are rolling in as you get them. Everybody's got an expectation that this is incomplete, right? And so it's reported that way. But Pete Buttigieg got days of being declared essentially the winner by the media. Days of that. Nine point now bounce in the latest New Hampshire poll. And we don't even know if he really won. In fact, by the numbers today, it looks very likely that Sanders did win by every metric. He certainly won what it looks like by the popular vote, but it is increasingly looking likely that he also won the state de delegate equivalents here, too. Yeah, and I'm still cautious on this. I'm going to say this has been such a crazy process. I want to see when they say they've got 100 percent and what they yeah. what they tell us. But with that understood, you're, you're right that, that there's a bounce that comes out of Iowa. Part of this is because our media is so obsessive with that that two-word headline coming out, who to judge wins or Sanders wins or whatever. Um, so the Iowa Democratic Party folks are not amateurs. They they know they knew what was going to happen when they when they released 62 percent as opposed to 68 percent or whatever. And so they should have waited until they got this, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And I have to emphasize, I'm especially concerned that the satellite caucuses, which uh, were really the place where you saw so much of the diversity of, of this vote, where you, you saw working class people who worked nights uh, caucusing near their factory, where you saw people caucusing in mosques, people caucusing in multilingual, multiracial, multiethnic communities. Uh, these satellite caucuses um, are the last ones being reported. 
And I, I find it amazing that you would release 62% and say, yeah, and then later on, we'll give you, we'll give you the rest of this. Yeah, Why did they just do it all together? It really is wrong, John. One of the things you were talking about in the break is about looking at some of those areas, about you know religious communities and diverse areas. Talk to us about some of the things that you've learned there, maybe that you've heard from uh, from others about what came out of that as a result. Yeah, this is one of the lost stories of Iowa that's an important one. Many people are saying, well, turnout wasn't that boosted. And they are right. The overall turnout will not be dramatically larger. In fact, it'll be relatively consistent with 16 or roughly in that range. We'll see what the final number is. But there is simply no question that there was a dramatic boost in youth turnout. I saw it in the caucus I went to. And also a significant boost in turnout by uh, working class folks who work the nights, by people of color, by people from religious minorities. I mean, there's a lot of evidence here that efforts to do the best with Iowa, which remember is a state that is overwhelmingly white, but efforts to get the fullest picture um, paid off. And here's an interesting element of it. The campaign that, that, you know, by all evidence, really committed to trying to reach out to all these communities, to Latino voters, to Muslim voters, to people who spoke multiple languages, to people who do work nights, um, was the Sanders campaign. And when we see these satellite caucus results coming in, you're seeing stunning numbers um, in favor of Sanders. And so uh, it just strikes me that if we respect the efforts to, you know, have a democracy that reflects the whole of our people and that, that begins to to respect the difficulties that some people have in participating. Um, this is, there is a, there's a good story here. It was just delayed for days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's actually a beautiful story. We had um, Sanders senior advisor Chuck Rocha on here who, who was, you know, organizing many of those communities. He said that Bernie Sanders won 98% of the Spanish language satellite caucuses, which is truly astonishing. It also, though, John, I mean, it, it does validate the, the sort of core of their electability argument, right? That it's possible to bring in people who've been excluded from this process, who haven't been valued in the process, who have barriers to participating in the process, that that is in fact possible. I mean, Iowa was a kind of a test case, and it seems that their thesis was born out here. Yeah, I stuck around in Iowa some, uh, and one of the reasons I did was because I wanted to look at um, some of these efforts to reach out to Muslim American, uh, Asian Pacific Islander communities, uh, and others, because while Iowa has small communities uh, in this regard, there are states coming up that will have quite large communities, and I was interested in the outreach, how it was done, whether it was just people helicoptering in, or whether it was people on the ground, you know, empowering the grassroots. And I saw some pretty good models in play in Iowa. If those are extended out of this state, they could have real meaning in the rest of the process. And, and frankly, even heading toward November. So it is a beautiful story. It's an important story. It's not just Sanders. It's, the, it's a much broader story of, of efforts made and what worked, what didn't. And to have that diminished, at least in the early stages, is, dif is difficult and frustrating. Although I will tell you something. This story that's developing today as the satellite caucuses come out does place an emphasis on some of this. So at the end of the day, um, we may, uh, I certainly myself, will try to write some of that story. Mm. Yeah, yeah I hope, I, I'm glad you're doing that work. I hope you're right about that. And I, I think you're absolutely right that this is so much bigger than, you know, just one campaign. This is about, look, if you value voters, if you tell them that their vote is important and that and, and give them a reason to participate in this whole process, they will come out. And that is an incredible thing um, to see for our democracy. John, thank you so much. You, Great to have you. Honored to be with you. Absolutely. Next on Rising, President Trump has been acquitted in the Senate. Crystal and I unpack the latest developments. That's next.